Well, hey everybody. Welcome to the Powell Brothers Have a Podcast. We're here. We're doing it. Hey, uh, how do y'all feel? One. First episode. I think Dude, this table is really nice. It is. Mike and I spent, um, I don't know, I 20 whole minutes yesterday putting this together. Dang. And you can see the fruits of that label. Yeah, and you might not be able to tell us on the internet, but we immediately need to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> But that's a problem for episode two, The Table Strikes Back. Yes. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> sequels. We're talking about sequels already. Sequels already. Sequels on sequels on sequels. Absolutely. So we've been like, um, you know, we've been running like crazy, getting this space together. And um, there's just so many kind of different, there was so much stuff we could possibly do. And so many people said, hey, you guys should do a podcast. And for a year and a half, we've said no. <laughs> um, but here we are. Pal Brothers Episode 1 podcast. Um, super excited. And we figured for the first episode, we're going to have Twin Bears. Twin Bees. Twin Bees. So I know a lot of people like close to us are quite familiar with you two, but we haven't really shown y'all off to the world. We're kind of keeping it a Pal Brothers Farm secret, but there are yeah. bears in them hills. Hey, man. <laughs> there we go. Use the title away. in the episode. Okay. We're the bears. Grizz and Bish. We We've been bears. bears. Who are you? Tell us about you. You. Who are you? I am Mike Bishop Smith. Mm. I am Blake the, the Grizz, Grizz Sessions. Sessions. Hold on. I'm going to take a break to have Austin fact check this. He is indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Poor oh, man, that was perfect. Mike, what, what do you do, man? Who are you? Tell us about Mike Who, are, who am I not? Yeah, I'm a lot. I'm all things to all people. Amen. Dude, wow. you know I got. Come on, a mullet. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a Kentucky Just fried facial hair. That's. I mean, I don't. I don't want to like stop you there because I feel like you're about to get on a roll. But maybe we should just quickly go over the hairstyles since you joined the band into now. Do we have pictures? Of the oh, we have to have pictures of every step. I'm sure. We don't do know have. right now, Listen, but assuming we do, you're gonna see them right now. Imagine <laughs> it's gonna be down at the bottom, starting off blonde. Oh no no no! Not at the bottom. This is these are full screen, full screen shots right full here that you're looking shots. at. Okay. Okay. Right. We're talking about some full screen. So there's blonde. Take us through these pictures. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'm, pretty sure, I'm pretty sure there's a video or something of me on a treadmill at Fifi Dubois. Oh wow, yeah. There was a treadmill oh, that's there, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. The with the band. Not a treadmill. It's the old thing where you just strapped in and it just shakes you. Oh yeah, I know <laughs> what you're talking like about. Me shaking. Yeah. <laughs> um, Did it work? I, I can't remember. Something. That's a lot of people don't know this, but there's a venue in San Angelo called. Um, Fifi Dubois, House of Fifi, House Dubois. Of Fifi Dubois, and she's yeah. been super, super kind to us forever. Um, and we had played there a couple times, but the last few times they started putting us up and they have this like in insane apartment above the venue. And I think you have no idea, but it's like, I, I don't even know how to describe it. It reminds me of like, I don't know, some like New York kind of style, like loft, but it's, it's just massive space. Just, yeah, way too big for, for yeah. actually New York style. Wait, style like, loft. Yeah, true, yeah. Um, yeah, it was like a massive amount of bunk beds, little basketball court, kitchen, and then like rooftop access. And then there's also some vintage workout equipment. <laughs> and I got to work on a vintage style. Yeah. So I started blonde, been bald. That's right. It's right. I had the tight, you, yeah. high and tight fade for a while. The thing is, like, really anything works for you. So on my end, like, that's massively frustrating, but it works for you, so. I feel like my family's starting to wonder about me now. Starting to because of the the hair and the facial hair, like the change. I've I've dove deep yeah. into the countryness that is the Powell Brothers. I, th I think we all just hate you because you still are growing hair. <laughs> That's that was my point. Everywhere back, yeah. It just it kind of like ticks me off that no like you wear a hat just because you want to, mm. versus some of us are wearing hats so people don't know stuff. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great plug for sponsorship, yeah. guys. Amen. Real game, sponsor us now. <laughs> this episode brought to you by Keeps. So I play okay, drums in the band. I uh, dabble in some tour management, dabble in some Ableton and tracks and vibe. Just overall vibe. Let's let's touch on that because I feel like vibe management is is a big part of. Uh, and I think a lot of people who aren't in the industry don't realize what a vibe manager is and how important they are to a crew. Sure. And really, I'm not good at anything else, 
but go hanging on. out. <laughs> go on. <laughs> Just hanging out. It's fun to be around me. You're going to have a good time. It's not going to be the worst time of your life. Probably won't be the best time of your life, but it's going to be a good time. Yeah. Can't At our worst. Better than, better, most. Most. better than most. Amen. That's something you might even notice on, um, you know, we started this podcast and I even noticed there's incense burning right in the middle of the table. Dude. Vibe management. Vibe management. Yeah. That's why you <laughs> need right it. right here. Yeah. Definition of vibe management. If you don't have a vibe manager, that kind of stuff doesn't happen. This is, this is true. Yeah. This is true. Things fall through the cracks. I also always love that. So like, since you've been with us, like, I, I think the incense have been fairly consistent like on stage and like in green rooms and i love when like an older person who well i mean just like somebody older than us like will come backstage and they're like oh like i used to burn incense to cover up the oh, i should know what you guys story. are doing <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you guys are doing and honestly it's just because you never really know what the green room's gonna smell like That's very true. from the night before and it it's a proper good vibe yeah like, but didn't that come from a it was like a podcast or no it's like a youtube show where they have like the five essentials, like I can't go anywhere without. Oh yeah, it's the ten ten things you can't live without. Yeah. yeah, and like several of them, like I think we were both kind of surprised, but like several people always travel with candles, and we we're like, well, that seems kind of silly. But then they were like, no, like you're always traveling to like your space always smell like home makes a ton of sense. Oh, um, that's such a good point. That's what I was thinking was like, it's funny when like you said when people say stuff like that, and really all of us we kind of have a chuckle when they leave because we're like. We kind of just dig the vibe and like it, yeah. it smells like where, you know, the rehearsal space or the studio or whatever. Yeah. It's like much more innocent than people <laughs> like like to think that it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah, so I, vibe management overall is my thing. Yeah. You're so good at it, too. What about you, Grizz? I, um, I mainly focus on <laughs> disruption. <laughs> mm. <laughs> See, so we pair well. We do. I think we do. We work really well together. One of one of you tears us down, and the other one builds us back up. Good cop, bad cop. Mommy, daddy kind of vibes of like, dad's gonna come down on you. I would be the mother bear. Mom, mom bear. You know, just coming in saying, listen, "Don't listen to him. Don't listen to him. He hasn't eaten in a minute. He's a little hungry, angry. Let him. Let him cool down. Let him cool down. Let him cool down a little bit." He loves you guys. He really does. Um, more realistically, I guess uh, I am, I think, a little bit unique in that I'm a producer, studio engineer, who also still works heavily in the live space. So you guys brought, first brought me on as front house engineer for a couple of gigs. And um, I guess that kind of quickly... Mm -hmm. moved into other spaces because I'm also pretty passionate about the studio space and making records and uh, so it's been like awesome to work on this project because you know not a lot of artists work with the same people in those spaces both of those spaces and you guys have kind of prov provided the the room to be able to do that so it's been really nice to kind of work in both of those capacities um yeah, I know the moment that you like stepped into the studio, you just started like putting stuff together, <laughs> like building this incredible studio, just like finding pieces that we've collected throughout the years, grab it, all of a sudden it's making it on records. Like yeah. it's not just like it's everything, but it's it's been funny to watch again. You utilize things that we had but didn't realize the value of, and then you come in and just like turn it into this really great piece that has made huge differences on tracks of ours. You know, that's, that's like a really nice metaphor for like making records, right? Because it's like, we've all, I've always, my friend Ryan and I have all, often like made the comparison. Um, I should say this was, Ryan, this is Ryan's thing. I'm um, just borrowing it. But the comparison of like. He's not here to defend himself. That's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah. So Ryan, if you're listening to this, this is mine now. <laughs> um, but like someone that's operating in that like producer role or like even studio engineer role is is the idea of like a midwife. Like someone has done all of the work to create something, to create a life, right? And all you're doing Yeah, we did. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> and all you're doing in that space is kind of like um helping them birth that thing in a healthy way, right? Like that's it. Um 
and you guys have like set up this insane insanely cool foundation and so it makes it really easy for people like us to step in and go oh yeah it's all here you know and just kind of go to work and whatever so that's I think exciting. Mike and I work really together really well together in that capacity absolutely and part of it is just you know both of y'all even you know kind of from y'all's own perspective I mean we I think Tara and I both see y'all as you know wildly overqualified even more than y'all would you know speak for yourselves but it's, it's really cool just to have people who are confident in what they do and then coming in with like their perspective into what, like what we're already doing. And then it's just like refreshing kind of like over and over. Um, and then as we kind of just keep growing, um, it's, it's very interesting just to kind of see, you know, how, what happens. Yeah. Yeah. And now, I mean, how many, how many songs have we done together? I mean, we, I think we've released four, three or four singles yeah. together. So but we've recorded the whole freaking archives yeah. of the music that has not yet been heard, but will be heard. We, we're excited about it, but it's honestly, it's been a lot. I can't put an official number on it, but yeah, it's been, it's been awesome. Yeah. I mean, basically when, when COVID happened and we were quarantined, we built half of our barn into a recording space where we've tracked most of our, our records. And then we turned this, garage space into video studio and this is the first time doing something like this in it but it has been an amazingly useful space and uh yeah we could not have done all of this like this is just such a team effort well, i felt like some of this too spawned out of the 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 live streams that we did during the pandemic of we would do the full band things but i feel like people really responded to when we kind of just sat around and had a glass of wine we did the wine night things or whatever yeah. and we just kind of mm -hmm. like bs with each other and like talk and like talk with interact with people you know like i think yeah. there was a big response to that so i think that's kind of part of that like bringing this whole thing to fruition well, i feel like just all of us kind of come which we can get into that but like all of us kind of come from different slightly different like backstories um a lot of us were kind of behind the scenes guys or session players um and so like kind of stepping into this trap to where, you know, where we're, we're being front folks and stuff. Um, it's, it's definitely a totally different vibe. But like Taylor, and I think always go back to, you know, like, like the working class studio kind of like vibe. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, being more than just like, we're professional, like musicians, like us communicating on a different way other than just on our instrument. Um, so like doing something like this, like a podcast with everybody is, is super fun to actually get to talk about that. And, we look forward to like having you know people kind of comment and you know let us know what you want to hear about because um, I think I think the viewers or just people watching probably know more what they want to hear than we do um, yeah because we could talk about honestly I, I think a lot of people think you know do y'all sit around and spend a lot of time talking about like music and I think we've all been doing it for so long that we sit around and talk about dumb TV shows <laughs> and then we go do you know crazy music stuff yeah it's like it's like literally ninety percent of what we're chatting about on a daily basis has absolutely nothing to do with music. Yeah. Which is great. Cause like, that's the vibe that you have to create to be, you know, in a healthy creative space. And, yeah. uh, well, we've, all, that you guys have we've all just put in well. tremendous, like all of us individually have just put in tremendous hours on our craft. So it's, you know, I think there are different times whenever it's like, okay, we need to work on this practice a little bit, but just the reps that we all have under our belts for what we do. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's more about communicating and being in the right vibe than it is like, hey, we need to learn how to like play this as a band. Right. And I'll also say like we've worked together enough for like, and I even think maybe even subconsciously know each other's um, instincts. Yeah. And so like there's very little we have to talk about because we kind of already infer that like walking in to play a new song, like there's a lot of room for creativity, but at the same time, we don't really have to talk about it sometimes because we, we already know and yeah, then we yeah. can just feel it out in the moment. But Which just, is cool to me because yeah. like, I mean, we've been playing together since 2019. I did a stint with you guys for like nine months back in 2015. Yeah, we asked you to fill in for two <laughs> shows. <laughs> and I stayed for like nine months, which is great. Um, but it just, it's one of those things like to me, like that bond was formed relatively quickly. Like, I mean, you guys know because you guys haven't always been the Powell brothers. You've been brothers, you know, but we've always you've been, always the been brothers. brothers. There was there was a year where we weren't. I was just solo. 
but like you guys played for other guys. Like you were hired guns. You were the musicians and girls. And girls. You've, you've done it for everyone, um, all types. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's the unique thing for one of like working for you guys and working with you guys. Like, yes, technically we work for you guys, but we definitely feel like it's much more like a we work together as a team for one goal. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so like that's a unique experience for me. Um, I mean, I think it was the great Dominic Toretto said, you know, family is the most important thing. Dude, family Dude. first. Yeah. Family. family. The great Dominic Toretto. <laughs> <laughs> you, hit, you hit it, and I was like, oh, man. Is that a story? <laughs> like, yeah. I need to know about? <laughs> One of the founding fathers, Dominic Toretto. <laughs> The founding father of the first 20 Fast and Furious movies. Which we shouldn't get into this episode. I imagine we'll end up doing an entire episode. Because we did spend... Gosh, I shouldn't have even started talking about this. But <laughs> this last tour we were on, we did start from Fast and Furious 1 and go up until... We watched all, everything but F9. All of the, them. the most recent one. Because it was in theaters while we were on the road. Right. So we still maybe we should kick off this next summer tour with a with a right. screening and farewell. So. Well, I met a girl around the seventh movie, and so I missed the rest of it. <laughs> I just remember like watching the end of the seventh, where it was like the Paul Walker tribute. Yes, and we're like pulling into the Tetons at like Jackson Hole, Wyoming, like one of the most beautiful parts of the country, and we're like all tuned in. <laughs> That's an interesting. I've, I've told, I've, I've said this a bunch of times. In my life, I have been through Yellowstone National Park four times, and I've still never seen Yellowstone National Park. Oh, buddy. Oh. Yeah. As, I mean, Fast and the Furious is a great reason to miss. <laughs> well, so the one there was the year before that, though, you remember it was when right when they released the Michael Jordan documentary. Oh, yes. So I we were driving very through, well. Yeah, we were oh, driving yeah. through at like 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. And, and there was a massive buffalo yeah. in the yeah, middle of the road. It was a bison. Dude, we're just driving down the road in the middle of the night, and everybody's in the back. I'm driving, and I just see this blur, and all of a sudden we drive up, and it's a big furry truck. And it's it's just, just big as a around. Yeah. I remember you just, like, we stopped pretty short, and I all I hear is Taylor go, Oh my God! There's a furry truck in the road, <laughs> dude. It, it was the biggest animal I've ever seen, and literally just kind of trudging across the road and like yeah, taking a sweet time. Yeah, like we were going the speed limit, and like we were totally safe. And then all of a sudden, yeah, this massive thing is just right in front of us, and we kind of just we went right around it, and it was fine. But like, man, it was dark out there. Yeah. There were no no street lights, just. And so we, we would like to just take a quick point and say that no bison have been hurt in the touring life of the Powell Brothers. Thank goodness. Yeah. However, deer yeah. and raccoons have both suffered some pretty hard losses. Just a moment of silence for all the deer and raccoons we lost. <laughs> but also, dude, those raccoons suck, man. Yeah, yeah. 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 They, got, they got what was coming to them. They will damage your car way more than you think they will. Yeah. They're yeah. solid little boogers, man. Dude. Yeah, we so Some of those Texas raccoons. I mean, 20, 30 pounds. <laughs> yeah, we were, we were on, on the way back from California, and we made it all the way to Dallas in the middle of the night. Little raccoon runs out and bumps the back wheels of our trailer and destroyed the entire freaking like mechanism. We had to get a whole new axle. It was like from a raccoon. Come on, crazy. Come on, raccoon. Crazy. Gosh, we are we are soon going to have an episode. Featuring Austin, our our trusty. Honestly, I don't, we'll ask him what Facts his title is because he just he just fixes everything. Um, he's he's the guy behind the scene making this one happen right now. Mm -hmm. But the amount of just car shenanigans that you deal with as a band, and um, having somebody who knows how to actually describe all those events. Yeah. Versus, um, you know, before Austin was with us, I was I was the most senior car repair guy, and so when something would happen, I would just proudly stand up and say. It's broken. <laughs> um, so it's nice to have somebody who's slightly more understanding than that. Yeah, for sure. We've really upgraded, and we're much more sophisticated in our problems on these days. Yeah, we, we haven't fixed our car with a bottle of vodka and a toe strap in three years now. Yeah, that's a good sign. 
Yeah. Uh, hopefully, hopefully it will not happen again. <sighs> you just never know. You never know. You never know. I just realized that this is a really good knock on wood day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This and this is... is um, this is Butcher Block. Yeah, this is Butcher Block. And this is probably going to be the only episode that features our unfinished Butcher Block table. Because I we have to finish it within 48 hours, and we're already 26 hours in. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Okay, I don't I don't know if we want to get into how did we meet these guys because I I love the story of the first time we we ever saw Mike play drums. I mean, yeah, why not, man? Let's dive in. Let's do it. Go for it, Blake. So the first time that I the first time I ever met Mike, and so. Tara and I knew knew of Mike. Um, he was playing with a band called Leland, and we went to a show. It was off Fifty Nine. I should have looked up what church it was, but we came to see y'all. Um, there was like three bands. Y'all were the headliner. Y'all did Count Me In. I just like lost it, and I think we give you a lot of crap about that song, but like <laughs> I really, really do love it. And we, Tara and I used to play that all the time, like when we were doing church stuff. Um, oh, there's I, one of like my first EPs that I made. One of the songs was built off of the drum beat from that song. So yeah, super funny. We're big fans. All yeah. So you've been influencing the Powell <laughs> Brothers for a long time. Um, so that was, <laughs> and like y'all were great. Like we loved the show. It was also the first time I'd ever seen um, somebody get knocked out with the power of Jesus. It, it happened a lot in those days with Leland. Yeah, right? I'd never seen it, and I was also I was working at Willow's Church at the time, and I just remember I I left. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't want to get knocked out, man. Hey, I was just like I don't know what's going on. But it's like the best is I don't know if you've ever really tell you the story. The best part is like so next morning, like I go into church, and like Pastor Rob, and like Jeff Novak, and Caleb Cox are like there, and I'm like telling them they're like, hey, like cause I, the day before, I think I even got off early to go to the show. And so I'm like telling him like, hey, so like they started knocking people out with the power of Jesus and I kind of got uncomfortable and I left. And they just made fun of me for like five, <laughs> six months about it. Just like they would we'd be like in like a like a group like prayer thing, like before church. They'd be like, Hey Blake, do you feel comfortable? Do you need to leave? <laughs> <laughs> That's so good, man. How old were you guys? I was I mean gosh, I guess no idea. Seventeen probably? So then I would have been fourteen. Nice man. It wow. makes me feel a little bit old, but yeah, I had just gotten my first like um, ridiculous like church style pedal board made. So that's probably like 2010, 2011, maybe. No, 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 no. no. 2008, yeah. oh, 2007, yeah. 2008. Well, that yeah, okay. I'm trying to think when Count Me In came out. Oh, that song might not have been out yet. Hey, listen, it might not have been. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I, I got Santa Melodies was out because yeah, yeah, because Santa Melodies came out in like 2006. When this is like so yeah. back in the day, like I the first time we ever heard of Leland was um, there was this this like young kid from Houston who was writing songs with Michael W. Smith. Yeah, he's like 16. So, yeah, so like, and we were just like, <laughs> holy crap, who's this like kid? It still makes me so mad to this day <laughs> when really? I figured out how old Leland was. Oh you know, yeah, I was furious. I was gonna say, our dad was working at, K I guess he was the president of KSBJ at the time, and so like he, you know, what's he, KSBJ? I also have no idea what it stands for. The Houston Christian Radio Station. Well, that's yeah. like the call sign KSBJ. Oh, I see what you're doing. Yeah. Ah. Uh, you just helping explain to the camp. Yeah, that was that was gonna be way smoother. <laughs> so uh, that's how I met you guys is through your dad. He was playing bass at a church I was playing at. Yeah. Yeah, we like never approached you because we were like, this guy's like, yeah, like he's not gonna want to hang out with us. And then your dad's like, dude, he's playing, he's playing drums at this like six p.m. service. You should, you should holler him. He's he's not doing anything. Yeah, <laughs> he's not busy. I've seen him. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were like, uh, so we weren't there, but I assume the conversation was. Uh, I always picture, you know, my dad saying like, hey, like my son, like my sons have a band, like y'all should meet. Every time, like I think about that, I picture you as Rodney Dangerfield, like doing that eye roll in the Caddyshack movie. <laughs> like, all right, <laughs> okay. Honestly, it was pretty much the same, except for I was just kind of like, yeah, sure, they got a man. That's cool. Here's my number. Tell them to call me. I never thought you guys would call me. That's the, like I didn't learn that till later in life. That if if people ask you for your number and you don't want them to call you, the best thing you can do is give them your number. They, they generally call. don't call. They will may oh, never call. Never but did. you yeah. guys called. And it was like, hey, man, our drummer got sick, car broke down, something happened. And it was like, can you come play a show, like, the next day? 
Yeah. And it was like a two hour set. It like a House of Blues thing or something? No, this was in Austin for a Cinco de Mayo show. <gasps> Let's, I always forget about that. I dude. love oh, telling the story. Weird. Because it was the rattle. Yeah. Oh wow. So yeah. it was. A, oh god. It was a midweek. <laughs> the bad one. Dude. But it's, that was my first show with you guys, and I loved wow. it. I loved it. It was. It, we had a great time on. It stage. was such a memorable time yeah. for me. Because it was a midweek show. Wednesday. It was Cinco de Mayo in the middle of the week, so you knew like people aren't going to be getting crazy. They got to go work on Thursday. Everybody's right. been drinking all day. Right. They're not going to be oh, there. But still, Cinco de Mayo in Texas. It's true. You but never know. Close enough to Sixth Street. For it to be like a like six street party bar, but far enough away that nobody's walking to it. Well, and it right. had been a, it had been booked as a private party, That's right? And the day of, they canceled the party, and then the bar tried to be like, "Hey, we're open, we're open, we're open." And it was like us and the bartender. And I think, the yeah, I think there was guy. like two people in, and we started playing, and they left. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it's going well. It's going yeah, well. yeah. <laughs> But dude, I stayed with you guys for like, nine months. Yeah, let's go. And here I am. So yeah. it was such a memorable thing for me of like, dude, like there was, like you couldn't really hear each other. I didn't really know the songs, but just playing with you guys, it was an immediate vibe of like, thank God you were a drummer. Because like you knew like, here's all the body language you need to know where we're going to go and do. And like, here's a break. Here's a chop. We're right. going to stop here. Don't play that. Okay, that works. That's not right. But <laughs> <laughs> it was such a good time. Like, I love telling that story. And I just was like, it was just us practicing on stage in front of the... And then I remember we almost, um, we had to pull Blake out of there. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> at the end of the night, the owner comes over and slaps a 20 on the thing. and was like, hey, man, great rehearsal. Well, and just because I'm totally fine with talking Maybe smack about this guy, it wasn't the owner, it was the bar manager. Um, but yeah, he, <laughs> so yeah, we played for two hours. And there was, so there was like a little bit of confusion and like they, they posted online that the show was canceled. And then I had people reach out who were like going to come like, Hey, like I saw online that it's canceled. And I was like, the show's not canceled. It was a private party that was canceled. Like it just like, wasn't very clear, but yeah. Then at the very end of the night, like it is what it is. Like that happens sometimes. And like, you know, we're a young band. Like I, I get that it wasn't the biggest deal in the world then, but, um, Obviously, I was pissed in the moment. Yeah. Um, and see, so yeah, at the end of the night, the guy comes over and like slaps down a twenty dollar bill, and I'm like mid conversation with one of two people who actually like stayed and like hung yeah. out. And like he like comes and interrupts me, slaps down a twenty dollar bill, and goes, "Hey, at least it's a, a a paid rehearsal." I'm like, "Dude, we drove from Houston. You think we can get here and back on twenty bucks?" Yeah. And everybody's like working for free. Yeah. I think this is not a paid rehearsal. This is a loss, and you're not being very cool. Yeah, dude, you're not being very sensitive to our situation at the moment. Yeah, so I wanted to take out the rest of the cash <laughs> in his face, but y'all pulled me away from him. You know what's funny? We played there one other time, and you couldn't make it. Dusty Saxon. Dusty did. Saxon came and sat yeah. in. And it was yeah. the same kind of thing of Dusty. like, he didn't get, we didn't send him a set list, I don't think. I think yeah. he literally just sat down and like played. Yeah. And it was a two hour thing. I think there was, there were some people there that night. It wasn't, it wasn't yeah, the same no, experience, but. Yeah, quite a few people came out. And um, I also remember Nigel Fry came out. That's right. And Nigel Fry played uh, Upright Bass on our first record. Um, he also, he was a bass, yes. he, he, awesome, awesome dude. Um, we need to have him on the podcast. Assuming we don't get shut down. <laughs> um, <laughs> for making these rattlesnake. Oh wait, did we not mention the name of the bar? Well, we haven't said the full name yet. Oh, okay, so okay, we're, we're good. We're good. We're yeah. fine. You can make some Im inferences, but uh... yeah, Chad, we need you to check this before we release it. <laughs> we'll just right. bleep it out, man. No one it's will know. Fine. Yeah, every time we say rattle, it'll just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Love but dude, it. I love it, man. So that's how I ended up with you guys. Mm -hmm. Is I stayed with you guys for like nine months, and then I was like, all right, I really gotta go home, quit. Yeah. And then we just kind of stayed in contact. I called you every. I don't know if I should admit this, but I called you every month for the next two years and offered you a job. It was great, man. It was a good time. <laughs> and then I remember, like, I can't, we were in, um, I want to say we were in at Midnight Rodeo, like in Springfield or something. Hmm. Whenever it was around, it was right before Christmas. Hmm. So it's like we walked, it was a Midnight Rodeo, something like that. And we walked out and there was like a Mexican restaurant just like right to the right. You would have been Odessa. Mm, no, it wasn't. Was Odessa. It was, I don't think it was Odessa. Anyways. Uh, well, yeah, anyways, it doesn't matter. We're playing a show and like we're going to get dinner right before we go on. And I called you and did my every other two months. Hey, you should, <laughs> you should come like work for us. <laughs> and then, um, your just response was instead of like the usual, like, dude, like, you know, thanks for, you know, thinking of me. Like it was, Hey, let me get through Christmas and then like, let's, <laughs> let's meet. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And so I, I immediately like, you know, grabbed Taylor and I was like, Mike's in the band. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's happening. We got him. Yeah. Because I also love like that, that meeting that ended up happening was at Chewy's in Humble. And we ran into people who worked at the job that you were leaving, but they didn't know yet. Yeah. And it's like, we're having this meeting. I think we're taking tequila shots to be like, hey, you're going <laughs> <laughs> What are you guys celebrating? Nah. Yeah. No, a, and then, Tuesday. And then friends. Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. Friends. <laughs> yeah. To friends. Yeah. It's just, no, we're just having a friendly tequila toast to America. Taco. So it was Taco Tuesday. Taco Tuesday. Oh, Galco, which stands, of course, for friendship. Yeah, a lot of people don't know this, but the the wolf on Mike's shirt right there, um, his name is Galco, which is Hebrew for kindness. Oh, kindness. I thought it was friendship. Well, does Galco have anything to say? (laughs) And and so I'm pretty sure it's not true, but that's on the outtakes of uh, Step Brothers. I love it. He's got a little, like... (laughs) <laughs> model of wolves and he's like going through the names that's where that comes from yes i say it all the time yes. yeah it's totally it's an outtake from the step did we just become best friends yep, yep. The, how, how did y'all meet i don't i'm sure yeah, i actually don't story, but but i definitely I think we know. Know. It just been around we ran in the same circle so my wife is from the same area ah. and she was this hardcore kid scene kid she was a screamo like lead singer for a hardcore band. She's way more rock and roll than I am. And he ran in their circles, and yeah. so we had crossed paths. Yeah, so we kind of chat about this a lot, right? Like, I kind of went the scene kid path, you know? Uh, but yeah, he, uh, your wife was in a, a legendary, like, local, kind of like post-hardcore band. She was the front lady for the band and uh she was great she was uh really cool um a lot of 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 angry like emo yeah seeing kids are mad at me because like they're like did you pull her yeah (laughs) that could have been something man you pulled her out yeah you you wrecked something that was gonna be great (laughs) no but we were kind of in that world and what's funny is um so me and my friends played in bands and we're all in bands that played with them. Um, and that's, I guess, how we met originally. Yeah. But the funny thing was, like, Mike met his wife in that world, but we all knew Mike from Leland. Like, we all knew who Mike was. Right. And so anytime Mike would come around, we'd be like, dude, you'll never, you'll never believe who's here. Because <laughs> we're playing, like... We're playing, like, KC Hall shows for 200 people and, like, you know, that kind of stuff. Or, or at like, some youth group's, you know, house or something. Yeah. The Avenue, dude. The Avenue. So the famous menus were the Avenue <laughs> upstairs. And uh, what was the place? Did you play Java Jazz? Jazz? We played later? Java Jazz. Okay. But, like, more like Southeast Texas. I guess Okay. Houston is Southeast Texas, but, like... Deep Southeast Texas. There was a place called 412 Warehouse or something. Do you remember that spot? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was like a top story of some church, and it was just like an empty room that had a little stage on it that was shin high. So anytime any like mosh pits or anything would happen, and you'd get Preston in the front of the stage, it hurt really bad. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> yeah. It was. It it was spilled on the stage. We need to bring that back. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. And it was made out of plywood. It was unfinished. So it was right. just a very sharp corner of this stage, right? Oh, yeah. But there used to be, like, at any given Saturday night, there would be, like, 300 kids in there going crazy. And it was a lot of fun, but... Um, like 10 hardcore bands just going out. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it wasn't like any of us were any popular. We just all had 20 people that liked us. So we would all play the same night, and then there'd be, a, you know, a crowd. But... Um, I remember Mike coming around, and there would just be so much buzz. <laughs> like, like, I had no clue. Yo, that's my no uh, Yeah, you, unbeknownst to, to you. Uh, I was there to see Hannah and her brother, who yeah. I was friends with, because like, she wasn't quite on my radar at the time. She was like 16, I was like 19, so I was like, hey, man, that's illegal. Yeah. Oh, man. You know? Yeah. yeah. But I was friends, I was real good friends with her older brother, Isaiah. Right, right. And I guess from there, like, that's where we initially met, probably for the first time. And then years later, um, this would have been after you got off the road with Leland. You were doing 
um, some work for a label. You were doing some like A&R stuff for a label, okay, yeah, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we worked on a few projects at 4i Studios. And I think that's where like the real friendship the romance, was birthed. The bromance. The bromance. The bear man. That was the, the gestation period for the bromance. <laughs> And then don't years spend after hibernation that, period for such a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> then we woke up. Then we woke up. Two bears in a I, cave. And then Mike come in, Mike started working for you guys. And then one day you guys needed a front of house guy, so Mike called me up and I came and did a gig. And do you remember what your first show with us was? I do. Oh it no was, way! Uh, yeah, it was. Um, I, I can ne- I can never remember the venue, but it was um, in Helodes. Oh, uh, is this Floor's? San Antonio? Floor's, Floor's Country, Country Store. Store. Dude, that's a that's, strong Yeah, it's not a show. bad first show. It was good, yeah. man. It was, like, that was the first time. Yeah, Mike, yours seems kind of shitty now. <laughs> <laughs> but so much more memorable and special. I so agree. So much more memorable and special. I agree. Because I, I was the new kid coming in, and I was, like, like, it was honestly, when you guys played that first show, I was like, dang, these guys are good. <laughs> like, really good. And so... And you I'm got to know it. us. <laughs> <laughs> and you knew better. You quickly, quickly saw right through it. First of all, for the record, that's absolutely not true. You guys are for amazing. the record, we control what gets cut and what doesn't get cut in this podcast. <laughs> Watch closely for the cuts. <laughs> yeah. Dude, that's awesome, though. That's, that's super good. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, it's a great first show. Who did we play with that day? We played with somebody. It was, um, was it Bart? Like no, oh, you guys were headlining. Oh, oh, we were. Oh, it was. You guys were headlining. I played a show with them, Tan Lines. Yeah. Did they open? They opened. Yeah. Okay. The name of the band is Tan Lines. No, his single was Tan Lines. That show. Heck yeah. Just pause this. I gotta figure it out. Yeah. Because I feel bad now. Ask me. Google Tan Lines. Right okay, here. you got it. Continue on. The floors. Floor show. Floors country store. I mean, that first night was just great. Like it was. It was a good show. It was a good introduction to you guys. And the chemistry you already had going on stage as the trio was mm. so powerful. And it was really easy to just kind of step in and vibe with you guys for a few shows and then quickly move on to... How long were you like a fill-in before you were all the time with us? I honestly don't remember. Yeah, I don't know if it was like... I don't know if that any of that was like super well, well defined. I know like that was like I had only been like full time freelancing, so not with another artist or uh, um, anything else for like two years at that point, point. and so it was just a really nice transition for me because I was doing a lot of like live recording gigs and like more more and more studio work, more and more like recording work. Which is great. I loved that. And I remember having like a conversation with Mike was, you know, when you guys first brought me on, I was like, yeah, I would love to work with you guys, but like my passion is making records and I really want to be involved in any way I can. And you guys were like, yeah, of course. And so I, I can't really remember. I don't remember what that transition was like. I know it was like a month, you know, it was like two or three local weekends. So probably like five or six shows locally. And then I want to say, I remember, I think the, like, driving thing was we went out to, I did a a short run with you guys, and one of the first dates that we did was in New Mexico at, like, a a festival or a fair or something. Yeah. And I remember... I got a tetanus shot that day. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. I remember just jumping out of the truck and, like, kind of just assuming the production manager role, I just went up to somebody and they were asking if we could like use some backline and I just told them no. <laughs> I was like, no, man, we don't, we, we can't use backline. We've got, we've got a rig. It's going to go up really easily. It's going to be in and out. No problem. It'll be quicker if you just let us, let us do our thing. And you know, whenever And Taylor, I remember Taylor standing next to me going, yeah. <laughs> like, what you say? Well, for, for, for those of you who, who aren't familiar, like, yeah, every day we roll into a new town, a new venue, a new group of people. And so, like, having the mindset of trying to be thoughtful and courteous and kind to anybody you come in contact with, I think is a very good thing. And we've always in, it tried to, to handle things in that way. But, yeah, at a certain point, you know, you build a rig and you have it really well done. And uh, sometimes it may be a surprise to, like, 
to people who are at these venues that we go into. But a lot of times, our way is actually easier. And it's just a matter of like, let, let us try it our way. And I think you'll quickly find out. And so Grizz coming in and basically kindly, but firmly saying, no, we, we, we're going to do, we're going to do it this way and it will be better for everybody. Yeah. But it's, it's a, like every band I think has to go through that hurdle of like being accommodating to being a little more firm with what you need. Yeah. Again, you don't, you never want to be like, say, no, I will not do that. But more like what we have going on will make everybody's life easier. If you just give us this amount of space to do what we do. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like a lot of the supporting roles to the artist are about that, about like taking away those distractions to, so that you can just stand on the platform and perform the art that you've created, you know? And like when someone comes on your team that like just instinctively knows how to do that, like mm -hmm. be firm, but like also, no, we're going to do this thing. Like we respectful. We've yeah. spent so much of our time and energy creating this thing and we need to have certain elements to be able to make that work, you know, make it be good. And like, so any, yeah, I mean like anytime someone just kind of steps on and goes like, Hey, we're going to make this as easy for you as possible, but also we have to do certain, like there are things that, you know, just have to happen in order for this to be a success. And like, um, so I just, I remember that being like maybe like a turning point where it was like, yeah, 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 that's right. That's right. But it's also like, it's super rare to have an audio engineer that, um, is really good at live stuff and is very good in the studio. Like it's, it's generally you have separate people. Um, cause they like, are two different yeah, talents. very different yeah, jobs. Yeah, yeah. And so like, it was, we were very, I think, fortunate to, cause like, we weren't looking for somebody who could be good at both. We were looking for somebody who could, you know, take care of us live. And then whenever we started getting in the studio together, it's like, not only do we have a flow there, but you know, it was like, okay, like Grizz is good at this too. Yeah. yeah I mean, 2020 forced everyone, I think, to rethink like the way that we do things and what we could do. And yeah, like that, like, again, like what could have been like a massive setback, I think really did us as a team, like a lot of good. Yeah. And on that, like, on that note, like Mike, Mike setting it up to you guys. Cause I communicated to Mike. I was like, Hey, look, here's where I'm at. Like, this is just something that I would want. Cause there's no guarantee in that space mm -hmm. that like, you know, if you're a, if you're a really good live engineer or, or production manager or something that, and you also have a passion for like studio work and stuff, there's absolutely no guarantee that you're going to just find an artist where they have need for both and then are willing to even like give that a shot. And so I kind of communicated that to Mike and Mike teed it up to you guys um, originally, I think. And then like y'all just kind of created the space um, for it to happen. And I was super thankful for that because that's, that's just something that doesn't really happen. I don't think in the music industry, I, I don't think people are even in the, in the headspace that like one, does the other or can do the other. Now, of course, that's the rule and there are plenty of exceptions to that rule, but um, I was super thankful coming on knowing that like, this is an artist that has every bit of potential, is very insanely good at what they do, um, but also has space for bringing on some team members that, you know, have unique uh, set of skills, skill sets. <laughs> oh, I'm a Liam Neeson. <laughs> the Liam Neeson of sound guys. I feel like we're all Liam Neesons though. Like, you know, like we all, I, I think in this, like in the modern music industry, you kind of have to be, it's very true. And that's, that's kind of, that's why I'm so thankful for it because like the shift is obviously kind of going towards kind of smaller teams that all just kind of work together and trust each other and everything. Because unfortunately, like tons of people are used to getting, just kind of steamrolled in the industry. And, you know, it's nice to be able to just kind of have a small team that you trust that you can just kind of work well with and, and be creative with and everything. Yeah. I feel like it's a different way to go about it. I mean, there's still going to be the artists who are kind of going like the major way, but, um, but to be able to like build a family that's doing this for a career, um, we're super thankful to have you all as a part of it. Um, but I, I think the opportunity that it allows is, you know, we're able to create in such a different way that you just can't 
there, there's no other way else to do this other than just to live with a small team of like very, very talented individuals and just grow together and kind of all keep pushing each other. Um, I think as, you know, as we start getting better at like telling the stories of why we do this and like why we love doing it, um, hopefully we're able to kind of explain that better, but the stuff that's going on here, that's, that's starting to go on here, um, that happened the past couple of years, I, I think is, is special. And, um, as we kind of get that out more, um, I think people are gonna start to take notice. Sure hope so, cause I don't yeah. want this to end. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Give us your money. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I, the, the future success, this is the foundation, you know, that that, that will be built off of. Yeah. So it's all about that core team, man. Core team. That's good advice for- Twin bears. So like, yeah. Get some bears. Get some bears in your life. Get some bears in your life. Um, but also just any like any any artists coming up, like focus on your team. Like make sure you have a team around you because there's no such thing as much as like we, we want to talk about, there's no real such thing as independence. Like you are you are dependent on something yeah. from birth to the end of your life. And like the more people you can put in your corner that love you, that you trust, and all that kind of stuff is gonna set you up for like a whirlwind of success. And that's exactly what you guys are doing. So kudos. I was chatting with somebody the other day to kind of tack onto what you're saying of, is just finding one person, start with one person that believes in what you're doing, that's gonna champion you. Yeah. Start with them because I feel like it's kind of one of those things where it's like, it'll grow from there. Cause it's like, they believe they'll go find somebody that's good at what they can't do or whatever. And then the, they'll, sell you to that person and say, Hey, listen, man, like these guys are whatever. And then your team grows from there. It's kind of yeah. what happened here. That's a really good point. Yeah. All right. Great. Well, I think we're, we're running low on time. So yeah. Sorry guys. We set out to shoot a 10 minute episode pilot for podcast. Um, and I think we're close Pushing to an hour 15. in. Yeah. yeah. Which, I mean, I feel like we're going to start doing this a whole lot. Um, but hope you all enjoyed this. Uh, we'll just, Right here. I hope you all enjoyed doing this. And then, and then hope uh, that y'all yeah. enjoyed this as well. Welcome to uh, the new format. One of the new formats. Uh, yeah, we have a whole lot of stuff coming out. Um, TikTok is a big thing this year for us. Um, right now, our single buy a ticket just was released on uh, streaming platforms. And then here pretty soon, it's going to be out on radio all over Texas and more. You have video coming. You have video coming in again. Several buy videos ticket. coming out. That new single buy ticket. This is buy ticket. This this group right here. This is that's Home, super cool. Homegrown. Homegrown. Home grown, farm to table. Ooh. Oh, oh. Ooh. I don't know why we would knock on wood for that. But. I don't know, but I'm glad we did. Um, anybody have any last words? I just want to really say that I love the farm to table thing. That's a, <laughs> that's something we should farm to table productions. Maybe yeah. I like it. Yeah, let's go. Let's farm go. to table podcast. Well, y'all stay tuned. We have a, again, a lot more coming. So. Yeah. And whatever farm to table thing we decide on, um, you're going to see the graphic for it right now. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> y'all take it easy.